All right, so hidden neuroemergencies. Every topic we talk about today is gonna to be your most common things you see. We try to tailor this into what comes into our hospital from JFRD. And so I, we're not gonna throw a lot of zebras at you. Uh, medicine of zebra is something you just don't hear much. Um, so more horses. We hear horse hooves, we wanna think of horses. We wanna think of what the basics that we're gonna see the most common things. Um, so I'll try to give you a little bit of clinical pearls that sometimes medics ask me, hey, what's this? I hear this term you guys use in the hospital we never hear out in the field. What does that mean? So I'll try to give you a little bit of that as well. Stop me at any point if there's something you don't understand. All right, I really want you guys uh, to get this information. So neuroemergencies. I'm going to go through a couple different major neuroemergencies. This is probably the most common one you'll see. Actually, headache is what you guys bring to us the most, but there's really not that much to do about headache in the field, and it'll be about one slide. So really one of the more common neuroemergencies is ultramental status. It's important to know about ultramental status, it's all about differential. There are a million reasons for ultramental status, um, but and it's not totally your job to figure it out, but if you can come to us with some sort of history or something from the scene that can help us hone down the diagnosis, awesome. Because last time we get there and we don't have any of that information, we're starting from scratch and doing what we essentially call veterinary medicine, just ordering every damn thing we have, ordering every CAT scan we have, try to figure out exactly what's going on. So does anyone know a good way to remember the differential diagnosis of ultramental status. Anything come to mind? Anyone heard of mnemonic for this? Anyone heard of AIEIOU -E tips? Yes. All right. So I can never remember this one, and I don't think it's that important to remember, but at least keeping uh, the majority of them in your head. I see everyone scribbling down. Again, this will be online later. You're welcome to write if you want but it might make your hand tired, you may not be able to pay attention. Again, if you want to write, great, but I'll have this up online for you. Uh, so we're gonna go through each one. Does anyone know what A stands for? These are reasons for ultramental status. So alcohol, pretty common, especially when you're taking your patients to Shands. We tend to have a high prevalence of this. E, anyone know? Epilepsy, so seizures. So we'll talk about seizures in and of itself later, but definitely a, a cause that we need to try to rule out because that's something, someone comes in altered and we think it's something else, oh, there's on drugs or on something else, but ends up being a seizure, we're missing something pretty important. And this is where your history comes into play. I, insulin, so diabetics. Have they taken too much insulin and they're now hypoglycemic? Have they not taken enough insulin and they're now hyperglycemic? Both of them can cause ultramental status. Overdose, so lots of different overdose we can talk about, uh, but many of them can cause ultramental status. Uremia and underdose. Uremia is, you think of an um, in-stage renal patient who's on hemodialysis. If they haven't gotten their dialysis in a few days, different toxins can build up in their blood and cause them to not act right. So again, great question. Oh, I see you have a big pulsing fistula here. When was the last time you got your dialysis? Uh, underdose. So certain medications keep people mentally right, whether that be psychotic medicines or whether that be something for the thyroid. So again, it could actually be that they're not taking enough medication and that's why they're not acting right. Trauma, so head trauma we think of. There's neck trauma that can cause trauma to the vessels here and not perfuse the brain well. Infection, so overwhelming infection, sepsis, that can make someone not act right. Psychotic, obviously we have a lot of, a lot of mental health issues in our community, uh, but psychosis is a common cause. And finally, stroke and shock. Good news for you guys, there's only a couple you really gotta worry about next because there's only a couple that you can actually diagnose in the field, like truly diagnose, and only a couple that you can potentially reverse in the field. So again, a long list, but really the ones that you really need to worry about are insulin, overdose, shock due to hypoxemia. And those are the ones that you're gonna be able to maybe reverse and definitely diagnose. So, get the patient in the back of the truck, what are we gonna do? According to your SOGs, uh, kind of that standard first line support of care, we're gonna do our ABCs, IVO2 monitor, and then treat the treatable. So, going back to that list, what were some of the treatables that you could do treat in the back of the truck? Do you remember? Okay, insulin meaning what? Okay, good job. So hypoglycemia, that's going to be your main one. You can't imagine how many patients come into ultramental status and 20, 30 minutes later we realize, oh crap, their sugar's just low. And, that's, and we've just missed the easy stuff. Uh, so <laughs> never miss the easy stuff. Always get a, a glucose and acu check. And per your protocols, you're able to give D, uh, D50 25 grams IV or IO and then repeat a half dose after that. Uh, glucagon, if you're not able to get an IV, glucagon is your go-to. So remember, just the point of this is do not miss the basics because you feel really dumb if you call a stroke alert and then the glucose ends up being 25. And we do it all the time, we feel dumb about it too. 
Overdose. So the one overdose that you guys can really treat is narcotics. So your oxycodone, hydrocodone, morphine, dilated, whatever it is, you can give Narcan or naloxone for that. And the dose being 0.4 milligrams IV, IO, IM, and repeating to a max of one milligram. So this reverses opioids. It's important to remember, o opioids are narcotics, again, your hydrocodones, oxycodones. It does not reverse other stuff. So the person may still have benzodiazepines on board or something else that's sedating them. So you might reverse one med, but you can't reverse the other one. So also if they say, oh, that person takes a lot of clonopin or they take a lot of Xanax, it's not gonna reverse that. They may have multiple medicines in their system, but you may not see a full response. So any smarties in the room, does anyone know a non-opioid medication that Narcan reverses? That it can be somewhat common overdose in children. Anyone know? You almost raised your hand. Well, I, <laughs> You're, don't, I don't think it is. I was gonna say aspirin. Just say, oh no, no, good thought though. Anything else? All right, most of my residents don't know this either. So clonidine. So clonidine is a high blood pressure medication, hypertensive medication. So a lot of older folks have clonidine in the house. Kid gets in the, in the pill cabinet and starts taking pills. And there's a few pills that can kill a kid with very few of them and we have to treat it. And clonidine is one of those. And due to sharing different receptors, Narcan can actually reverse it. So again, this might be a good time to call in your medical direction. If you go to grandma's house and they say, my kid just down that bottle of clonidine and the kid's not breathing, it might be a good time to call your medical direction and say, can I give some Narcan? All right, it's not in the protocols, but just know in the back of your head that is actually uh, another use for it. All right, altered mental status, shock. So again, the shock that you guys can treat immediately are gonna be your hypovolemic shock um, and your hypoxic shock. So for hypovolemia, we can give up to 20 milligrams per kilogram normal saline to a systolic of 90, and O2 to keep your oxygen above 95%. All right, so again, those are the things you can, you can treat and diagnose, your overdose, your hypoglycemia, and your hypoxia or hypovolemia leading to shock. Any question on that? You guys will see altered mental status so much, and you are really the completing piece of the puzzle to get as much seen information as you can. You can't imagine how many families just refuse to come to the hospital once they're in the back of that red bus right there. And then we never get to talk to anyone again. So as much information you get on scene, medication list, any signs of trauma, anything like that, please let us know, because it really, really helps. All right, moving on to strokes. So one of our more severe injuries, one of the things you really worry about. All right, so what is a stroke? I found a nice video with a very nice sounding lady to tell us what a stroke is, so I'll let her do it. But what exactly is a stroke? The brain, like all parts of the body, needs oxygen which it gets from the blood. A stroke happens when blood flow to the brain is cut off. When brain cells are starved of oxygen, they become damaged, and the symptoms that follow are called a stroke. As the brain controls the whole body, the symptoms of a stroke can be wide-ranging, depending on which parts of the brain are affected. If the stroke occurs here, it would cause a drooping face, here, weakness in the arms or legs, or here, difficulty speaking. Other symptoms can happen too, like changes to vision, loss of balance, confusion, and memory loss. The effects might be barely noticeable, but are more often severe and disabling. Sometimes these changes can be reversed if treatment is started early. That's why it is so important to act quickly if you suspect a stroke. Remember, you need to get help fast. F is for face. Is their face drooping on one side? Can they smile? A is for arms. Is there weakness in the arms? Can they lift them both up? S is for speech. Is their speech slurred? T is for time. If you spot any one of these signs, then it's time to call an ambulance. Once the ambulance arrives at the hospital, a doctor will assess you and arrange an urgent scan of the head, which shows where the brain is damaged and what type of stroke has happened. Strokes are put into two groups depending on the problem in the blood vessels supplying the brain. There can either be a blockage, called an ischemic stroke, or a bleed, called a hemorrhagic stroke. The majority of strokes are blockages. It's important to identify early on which sort of stroke has happened, as they each have very different treatments. Blockage strokes are commonly caused by the buildup of fatty material in blood vessels. This fatty buildup may lead to a clot, which blocks the blood supply, just like in a heart attack. This is why a stroke can be thought of as a brain attack. A clot may occur within the brain, or it can travel from another part of the body, commonly the blood vessels in the neck. 
Clots can also travel from the heart, which may happen when you have an irregular heartbeat called atrial fibrillation, or AF. If a blockage stroke is detected within the first few hours, a clot-busting medication is sometimes given to dissolve the clot. This is called thrombolysis. If thrombolysis can't be used, other medications such as aspirin will be given as treatment instead. Bleeding strokes happen when a blood vessel bursts suddenly, causing blood to leak in or around the brain. In these strokes, blood on the brain can lead to swelling, a serious problem which may require surgery in some cases. Sometimes, stroke symptoms completely disappear in less than 24 hours. This is called a mini-stroke, or TIA. Often, symptoms only last a few minutes, but just like with a full-blown stroke, you must go to hospital immediately if you suspect a TIA. This is because a TIA is a warning sign that you're at high risk of having a full stroke. All right, so a couple important things there. First off, I think it's important for you guys to know the different types of stroke. Often, medics and EMS folks don't get that information. They just know there's a, this thing called stroke and we need to treat it like this, get in there fast. But they don't realize or they're never told there's different types. It's all plumbing, so the pipes in the brain, the most common cause, 85%, is something clogs the pipes. That's an ischemic stroke. You don't get blood to the brain. The less common cause, but a scarier one, is the pipe bursts, so hemorrhagic stroke. Those patients look like crap. They're usually blood, blood pressure super high, they're diaphoretic, they're altered as can be. They look terrible. So just so you understand, when you get there and you might hear us talking about different treatments we're gonna do and things you might not do, it's based on the different types of stroke we're looking at. And that's one reason why we try to get the patient to the CAT scan so fast. We want them in the CAT scanner within 10 minutes of hitting our door and that's because we need to differentiate what type of stroke we're talking about. Uh, next thing is that uh, atrial fibrillation. Again, when you're in the truck trying to kind of make your diagnosis, if someone with atrial, someone has atrial fibrillation, so they have that irregular, irregularly irregular EKG, they're a more common, um, a higher risk of having a stroke. Does anyone know exactly why that is? What's that? Exactly. So your heart on a good day goes like this and it squeezes blood forward. When you're not contracting normally, not regularly, you start building little microclots inside your inside your heart. And if you're not anticoagulated, if you're not your blood isn't thinned on something like Coumadin or Warfarin, those clots can shoot up to your brain, block the pipes and cause an ischemic stroke. So again, when you're trying to build your differential and you see that person has AFib and they're having stroke symptoms, it might it might uh, bump up your suspicion. And finally, the thing that I talked about last, the TIA, so stroke symptoms less than 24 hours, still technically a medical emergency or urgency. They still need to be evaluated. They usually get admitted because their risk of stroke over the next couple of days is greatly increased. So if you go to someone's house and say, man, I couldn't move my arm, I couldn't talk for about an hour, now it's gone, you should still really encourage that person to come to the hospital and get evaluated because they, they still need a further workup for that. So how do we detect a stroke? They talked about this in the video real quick. It seems like a simple kind of bystander mnemonic, but it actually works out really well. It's the Cincinnati Stroke Scale, and it's actually this first two, three right here, but it spells a nice word fast. So what does the F stand for? Face. So it's pretty easy. Hey, can you smile for me? And they try to smile and they only have one side of the face that kind of look like this guy right here. You can do other things. Can you close your eyes for me and not let me open them? Can you puff your cheeks out? So other things, but the basic thing is can you smile for me? And you're looking for um, uneven smile right here. Arms. So a couple different things you do for arms. Usually we have them hold their arms just right out in front of them. Uh, you can have them grip. You have a couple other things. They used to always teach putting them up to the ceiling, closing their eyes, staying on one leg, doing all this stuff. Just put them out in front of them. See if they can hold it up. Uh, if they really have a stroke, they're going to start drifting down. Um, also, I like to do quick grip strength. Hey, squeeze both my hands really hard. Can you? This is how I do my quick neuro exam. So squeeze my hands nice and hard. All right, pull against me. All right, push against me. Right there. So now I've, I've had my hand muscles, I've had my major muscle groups up here, and you can really tell differences just in, in quick three seconds. Very good job. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's your arms. What's your S? Speech. So are they talking okay? And a lot of times this takes a family member to tell, is this person talking okay? People talk weird every day. So it really helps. Hey, is, is grandma talking right? Or do you feel you're talking right? A lot of people, they know they're not. One thing, one of the most interesting things with stroke I found early in my training was I'd say, Sir, how are you doing today? And I'm really trying to get all this information out. I'm trying to get everything I can. I'd just be like, do you know what you're trying to say to me, but you just can't? 
Okay, and it makes it so much easier because are they altered or they can't speak? And you can tell this fear in their eyes that they know exactly what they want to say, but they can't say it. So right when you get that out of the way, okay, here's a piece of paper. Let's try to communicate this better because you're getting nowhere with them trying to talk to you when they actually can't. Uh, so you can have them try to say you can't teach an old dog new tricks or a, a sentence like that or just speak to you. You can kind of tell if, if it's off or not. And then time. So the next thing we're talking going to talk about time, and this is important. So we need to know the last time seen normal. Um, we'll talk about this in your SOGs, but when was this person last seen normal? If someone saw them an hour ago and they were normal at that time, so someone saw them at 8 o'clock, and I saw grandma at 8 o'clock and she was totally normal, that's your last time seen normal. If last time I saw grandma normal was when she went to bed at 9 o'clock last night, that's last time seen normal. Okay? Yeah, grandma could have stroked five minutes before she woke up, but we have to count that last time we saw her normal as that last time, as, as right before she went to bed. Do you guys understand that? That gets really confusing. Um, and I don't think it's something that's pushed hard enough with you guys because what, that's one of the most important pieces of information you can bring to us, and I'll tell you why in a second. But when was that last time she normal? Because that's going to send that, them down different treatment pathways. All right, so your stroke alert protocols. Again, basic uh, supportive care, ABC's IV O2 monitor. The Cincinnati Stroke Scale, which we t just talked about. So if any of the Cincinnati Stroke Scale findings are positive, so you have facial droop, or you have arm weakness, or you have a speech impediment, or d difference in speech that you're worried about stroke, or um, and you have an onset less than or equal to six hours, or the patient wakes up with the symptoms, and the glucose is greater than or equal to 50, you're, you're able to call a stroke alert. So again, symptoms less than six hours, or the patient wakes up with the symptoms. So again, you guys are still calling stroke alerts. So they, you may know, oh, they went to bed last night at nine, they woke up with it now. We still want that stroke alerted, but we need to know the information. Um, and the glucose is corrected. So why six hours? Well, we have a window of time in stroke care. There's this thing we were talking about earlier called, with thrombolytics. It's the clot-busting medication, TPA. Very controversial medication in emergency medicine because no one's really sure if it actually does any good and it might actually do some harm. Uh, but it's our current standard of care. And the thing is we have a certain window we can give that in. We can only give it really right now up to four and a half hours depending on the hospital you go to. Uh, so after that, it may actually cause worse, worsening outcomes in patients. So again, that's why our window is so tight and that's why the second you hit the door we're trying to get them cat scan within 10 minutes and back because we have a certain window of time once they hit the door that we can push that medication if we push the medication outside that window our hospital gets dinged by the regulatory agencies um, so it's really important for us to get that time and that's why we're really busting with questions hey when did this happen we're trying to call family we have to get them consented we're trying to consent to someone who can't talk to us so it's, it's a huge deal uh, but that's why we have that window. So a lot of you guys get upset and I understand why when you come busting that door you've done this awesome pre hospital exam. Oh man my Cincinnati stroke scale was on par. I was just slamming glucose. I look like a freaking rock star and then we hear the information and we're like oh and we all just walk away from the bed. It's because you might tell us oh now they're seven to eight hours out. Okay it doesn't mean we're not doing anything but we can't do the medication we're gunning our system up to do. We're going to do our CAT scan and everything but we can't give that TPA that clot busting medication because because we're outside the window. So again, you've done a great job. It's nothing to do with you. It's just we're out of our window that we can treat them. Depending on the hospital you go to, we can also do intervention. So that's where they snake a wire up through your groin or through your neck, kind of like they do with a cardiac cath and go up in your brain and actually either pull a clot out or stent something. Uh, they use a little vacuum to pull stuff out. And that, depending on what hospital the patient goes to, sometimes that can go up to 12 and even 24 hours. So again, it's all dependent on where they go. If you look in your SOGs, it, it does tell you where to go, comprehensive stroke centers and all that uh, based on your full exam right here, your Los Angeles Motor uh, Scale exam. Um, but again, that's all in your SOGs, a little more detail than we need to talk about here today. But evaluate for reversible causes, hypoxia. Make sure someone's not just having symptoms because they're hypoxic and hypoglycemia, and then take them to the appropriate center. This is your Los Angeles Motor Scale, scale and it's in your SOGs as well. But again, what this is gonna do is essentially differentiate how severe the stroke is, and you're gonna put that in all the pieces of the puzzle and, and determine where to take the patient. All right, other important questions. So this is the kind of information that we need to know and you may be the only one that's able to get it on scene. Have you had a stroke before? 
Very important. A lot of these people have strokes and they still have the same deficits on the side that they always have. So I might be doing that exam and they don't really have a uh, grip strength on the right side, but that's how they are every single day. So if you have had a stroke, what are the weaknesses? What weakness do you live with every day? And did you receive clot busting meds for it? If someone received TPA before, that might put them out of the window to receive it again. It's again very important information for us to get and you may be the only one who can get it. Did you wake up with these symptoms? And we already covered that, that's, that's what we talked about. We need to know, did you wake up with it and what, what time did you go to sleep? And were you totally normal when you went to sleep? And again, did you wake up with it or did you wake up and then half an hour later have these symptoms? Did you have a seizure before these symptoms started? We're gonna talk about that and why that's important. I'll, I'll cover that in a second. But do they have a seizure disorder and did anyone witness them having a seizure? Do you have any blood thinning medications? So some people are on Coumadin, Warfarin, there are a bunch of other medications that are new now and have really complex names, but essentially do the same, do the same thing. Are you on anything for a DVT or anything for atrial fibrillation or a PE that might thin your blood? And these are some of the names right here, because again, that's gonna help us decide whether or not we're gonna give that medication. Did you have a headache before these symptoms started? So one thing we, th we worry about, you can't really diagnose in the field, is a bleed in the brain, a subarachnoid hemorrhage or some other type of bleed, and that might make this person not a candidate for TPA. The last thing we want to do when someone's bleeding in their brain is give them a clot-busting medication, because then they tend to bleed more and they tend to die. Uh, so we're going to try not to do that. So if someone said, man, I had this terrible headache right before all these symptoms started, all right, hold on, we're definitely going to wait for that CT, we're going to look at the CT very closely and make sure we're not dealing with a bleed here. So what are some stroke mimics? So there's a couple things that can look like a stroke. And again, we don't want to be doing interventions that can possibly be harmful to this patient if it happens to be something else. So there's a couple different classifications that our stroke mimics can fall into. So hypoglycemia, so again, low sugar. A liver disease, again, liver, if your liver's not functioning, there's some other toxins that can build up just like with your kidneys that can mimic stroke symptoms. Uh, so good, this is where your history comes into play, asking the pa patient about liver disease. Infection, so the person has an infection of their brain or their spinal cord, that can obviously cause uh, some problems. Trauma, so head injury, carotid injury. So if the person was just in an MVC, and we've seen this before, and now they, they're talking weird and they can't move their left arm, well maybe they had an injury to the carotid, or maybe to the brain. Neoplasm, so cancers, any type of tumor pushing on the brain or anywhere else. And then a, cu a couple different neural problems. So complex migraine. You can't imagine how many patients I've seen that it's just a really bad migraine. Migraines do really weird things. I had a nurse come up to me one time when I was working in the emergency department. Healthy 35 year old female could not talk to me. She just looked at me and was going like this and she couldn't talk to me. And she had to write down that she could not say the words she wanted to say. And in my mind, I'm like, shit. And I was about to do a stroke alert. <laughs> like, oh my God. And uh, we had this crotchety old attending who came up. He's, he's about 60 years old, actually probably 70 now. Um, went to the Coke machine, got a Coke, gave it to her, and then walked away. Drank the Coke, <laughs> 10 minutes later she was fine because the caffeine helped her migraine go away. And it was just like, it was blew my mind. Um, but, <laughs> but again, <laughs> Do you have a history of migraines? Last time you had a migraine, did this ever happen? Do you take medications for migraines? Again, we can't blow these people off, but we see that healthy 30-year-old, you, your, your suspicion of stroke is a little less. Yes, 30-year-olds can stroke, uh, but it's just a little less. Uh, Bell's palsy, so Bell's palsy. Has anyone ever had Bell's palsy in here? My brother had it. Yeah, really, really weird. Um, so Bell's palsy essentially is inflammation or infection of one of the nerves up in your face. And what it causes is it causes you to have facial droop and it causes you to not be able to close your eyes and it causes you to not be able to speak so it looks just like a stroke and it's kind of crazy and kind of scary um, and it's again we usually see it in younger people we can see in older people as well it helps if the person is 25 then you're like it's probably the bells and there's some subtle differences in the exam that we can check to see if it's bell's palsy but again it's scary you're like i mean either sending this person home with steroids or i'm completely missing a stroke um, so again, it's, it's, it's just one of those things that can kind of jump out and get you and you really have to focus on. And the seizure, like I said, I was going to come back and talk, talk about seizures. There's a thing called Todd's paralysis. So what the hell is Todd's paralysis? We're going to talk about that in just a bit because I literally had a medic ask me that exact question the other day. What the hell is Todd's paralysis? So we're going to talk about that. All right, so seizures. You're going to see a good amount of seizures in your time in the field. So what does a seizure look like? So here's a, f a video, uh, despite how annoying the girlfriend is in this video, it's actually a pretty good depiction of what a real seizure can look like. 
It's okay. Just breathe. Just breathe. It's okay. Come on. Come on, baby. So that video goes on for a long time. I, I clipped it down. At one point, she goes, "Baby, stop seizing, stop seizing." <laughs> <laughs> but there are tons of these. I mean, this guy has tons of videos. A lot of people have seizures all the time. They make sure they film them and put them on YouTube. It's it's pretty educational. You do have to pick through the ones that are actually fake because there are a lot of fake ones out there. Uh, but I, unless this guy was just chewing his tongue just for fun, because um, you see he's bleeding all over that pillow, uh, it's probably a real one. Uh, here's a, the next video is going to be someone in the hospital. So people have seizures and they're trying to diagnose it. They'll put them in a special unit where they have a camera on 24 hours a day and they have an EEG, which is essentially an EKG for the brain, and it looks at their brain uh, electric, electricity. And so they'll be able to be monitored, monitored 24 hours a day to see when they're having a seizure. But you can see this lady right here having one. So you see her seizure, uh, eye blinking, kind of this posturing motion, uh, kind of generalized shaking. Everyone's seizures look completely different. There are some different types that they come in and we can call total BS on. But again, be careful in the field. Um, you, I've seen a lot of families getting really pissed off when uh, rescue just blows them off and says, ah, they said they're seizing, but we think it's fake. And people will say that in front of the patient in the family. And sometimes you're right. <laughs> But uh, just, um, yeah, it, it, it causes a lot of problems. Some people do have what we call pseudo seizures, which is a fake, essentially a fake seizure. Some people mean to do it and because they have some other type of gain. But some people have more of a psychosis and, and they're not able to actually know what they're doing. Uh, so again, treat, these, treat them all with compassion. Let us do the diagnosis and tell them on the other end that it's not a real seizure. <laughs> Um, but um, as you progress through your ed through your career, you'll kind of learn what's a real one and what's not. Um, a lot of them, it's, it's hard to tell, but again, just treat them all as real uh, and go ahead and bring them to us. Uh, this next guy, this last guy, one of the most unfortunate videos I've ever seen. Uh, imagine having a seizure while you're skydiving. All right, so you get these folks in the back of the truck, what are you gonna do? So again, basic supportive care, ABCs, protect the patient uh, and yourselves. We used to always, they used to always teach putting the wallet in the mouth and, and trying to hold them down and all that stuff. If someone's seizing, let them seize, all right? Just let them seize out. Don't, don't try to touch them. If there's stuff around them, move, it's basic EMS education. Move the stuff around them, get bystanders away, let them seize out. Also protect yourselves. During and after the seizure, these patients can be quite violent sometimes. They don't know what they're doing. Their brain just had an electrical storm. So protect yourself as, as well and evaluate for status. So what is status? Status epilepticus essentially is a prolonged generalized seizure. So they're having a seizure too long or they're having multiple seizures not returning to baseline. There's been multiple different definitions for status. The current one says about greater than five minutes. It used to be 30 minutes, but that's like crazy to watch someone sit there for, and seize for 30 minutes. So generally greater than the first, uh, five minutes of straight seizing is what we call status epilepticus. This is very dangerous. You're having a constant electrical storm in your brain, you're gonna suffer injury. Also, you're not really breathing right during that time. So again, you're gonna get hypoxic injury. So this is something we really have to worry about. And it helps us when you come in and say, yeah, they've been seizing the entire time they've been with me. They've had five seizures and in between each one they're not waking up that's also concerning to us so for your protocols if the seizure has stopped you evaluate your ABCs and you eval and treat hypoglycemia again a reason for seizure is hypoglycemia that comes up in a lot of different things 
Status epilepticus, first line is midazolam, two to five milligrams IV or IM, you may repeat that once. Uh, that's kind of our go-to drug now. Uh, it used to be more uh, Ativan, but we're going to midazolam now, and it has a lot better outcomes. And eval and treat hypoglycemia, like I said. So important questions, again, you are information from the field, so what else do we wanna know? Does the patient have a history of seizures? That's a huge thing, because someone who comes in with a seizure for the first time is getting a much different workup from someone else. If someone got, comes in and say, yeah, I have a seizure every week, and this is my normal seizure, all right, great, here, and let's make sure you're on your medications, and we'll probably have them out the door in an hour or so. Someone who's a first time seizure may be get, coming in the hospital and getting a lot, a lot more tests. It's also very important to know, because you can imagine how many people have seizures all the time. Uh, when I was lifeguarding on the beach of Donnell here, um, a couple years ago, we went, I went to a kid, a five-year-old kid, and he was seizing on the beach, and we are just lights and sirens. I mean, we are so freaking excited to go to this kid because it's a real emergency. And we get there, and mom's like, it's okay, he has six seizures a day. And I don't want you guys to transport him. Oh, okay. I mean, that's some people's norm. And some really complex brain injuries and, and chronic brain problems, they have multiple seizures a day. So a lot of people, sometimes they don't want to be transported. And that's okay. And you got to take all your things into in account there if you can trust the family or, or history or whatnot. But just know that people who seize will continue to seize throughout their life. Um, but if it's new or something different, um, or if they're not awake enough to talk to you, they need to come be evaluated. If yes, what meds are they taking? Again, very important. We can measure certain levels of medications. So if we know they're on Dilantin, I can measure that in the hospital and see if they're therapeutic on their medications. And then how often do they seize? Again, this could be a normal occurrence for them. Any recent head trauma? So a seizure from just having a seizure disorder versus a seizure from getting in a car wreck yesterday, two very different things. What is their post-ictal state like? So we'll talk about what a post-ictal state is. All right, anyone tell me what post-ictal means? Okay, anyone else? Okay, good, so anyone else? What's that? Mean? All right, good, so we got three different descriptions there and that's great because it's never the same for anyone. So ictal is the seizing period, so the post-ictal state is the post-seizure state. And we had unconscious and a days and mean, and I see all those on a daily basis. So it's just know that everyone's recovery period is not the same. They can be unconscious, they can be lethargic, sleepy, confused, afraid, or anxious, and also Todd's paralysis, which we'll eventually get to. All right, so what's the deal with Todd's paralysis? Again, I got this question the other day from a Nassau County guy because I kept throwing the word out to him and he finally said, dude, doc, what's the deal with Todd's paralysis? So Todd's paralysis is the interesting thing. So it's a focal weakness following a seizure. It can be extremity, speech, or vision. It can last up to 36 hours, but importantly, important to know it's not a stroke. That's why we want to know what a seizure is. Some people have a seizure and for the next four to six hours, they can't move their arm. Or for the next eight hours, they can't talk. And again, that's why it's important to know because and that's why we ask you that because that's very different. I'm not gonna push thrombolytics on that person because they're not actually having a stroke. It's just a focal weakness in their brain that we have, science can't really explain yet, but due to the electrical storm, they're now having that weakness. So that's, again, bringing it all back home why we wanna know about history of seizure. Any questions, neuroemergencies? Yes.